Welcome to At Home and Abroad with Harris and Walker. Join us each week as we explore the far reaches of the globe in search of unique characters and stories to share. Reach beyond your front door and let's chat about art, architecture, history, real estate, and more. Let's jump in. Good etiquette is not just knowing which fork to use with the shrimp at a fancy dress event. Customs and courtesies comprise a code of conduct in society, an often unspoken but widely understood set of rules for acceptable behavior. Decorum demands that we respect the customs of the society within which we find ourselves, even if they may be confusing and quite foreign. Today, we delve deeper into the historical roots of etiquette and its role in modern-day society with leading etiquette expert and CEO of Polo and Tweed, Lucy Challenger. So let's sharpen our social graces and pursue our passion for protocol as we explore the mannerly matter of etiquette. Good manners have always been a really important aspect of my parenting, Though etiquette involves so much more than keeping your elbows off the table and not chewing with your mouth open, doesn't it? It certainly does. When I was researching this topic, travel etiquette, specifically etiquette while flying, seems to be popping up everywhere as of late. Yeah, you're right. I've seen it come up on my social media feed more than once recently, and it's certainly something I often contemplate when I'm traveling myself. One topic which is currently hotly debated involves whether or not you should switch seats if you're asked by another passenger on a flight. Usually it's because two people didn't pre-book their seats or check in early enough and now they want to sit together. Right. It seems to be those passengers who are being asked to switch who are posting their discontent online. Mm -hmm. I would imagine there are some people who were refused a seat switch who are complaining too, but I haven't seen that reflected on social media yet. No, I haven't either, but really what right do they have to complain? If you didn't make the effort to sit together, can you really blame your fellow passenger who did arrange for their seat? I don't have much sympathy unless maybe there's a kid involved or a medical reason for the switch. Did you know that some airline policies may actually require you to switch a seat with someone so another passenger can sit with their child or an elderly or sick person that they're traveling with? I didn't know that. It seems like a pretty decent policy, though. When my kids were young, whenever we flew somewhere, I always made sure in advance that our children were with us. And I would definitely have sympathy for parents if they couldn't sit with their child. And I'd 100% switch with them, even though... To be perfectly honest, I depend on my husband's hand for crushing during turbulence. Me too. Yeah. So as a frequent flyer, have you often been asked to switch? Not really. Maybe once or twice in my life, but years ago, way before you could book your seats online. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. I personally have never been asked to switch. I'm not too picky about where I sit, really. I'm short, so I could really care less about whether I have the aisle seat or not. I also recently heard, though, that the window seat is the dirtiest seat in the row, so I'm definitely not interested in that seat either. That's so gross. I wonder why the window seat is so dirty. I have no idea. I think it may have something, though, to do with the rubbing of the head every. (laughs) Ew! You know, leaning up against the window and oh, all of yeah. that. Oh, yeah. Oh, gross. <laughs> well, I prefer the aisle anyway, thank God. <laughs> Easy access to the loo. I need that if I've had too much tea. So would you switch seats if it were just two adults who wanted to sit together? Maybe, maybe. As I said, you know, I like to crush my husband's hand during turbulence. So they would need a good reason, though. Maybe a honeymoon, perhaps? Yeah, that would make sense. Beyond seat switching, there are other do's and don'ts of flying etiquette. Some we've likely encountered before, but others may not have even crossed our minds. Etiquette actually begins before you even board the plane. Okay, so hopefully I haven't been breaking any unwritten rules. Bring it on here. (laughs) I doubt it. I doubt it. Etiquette really involves employing respect for others. For example, plan ahead and arrive on time so you don't have to ask to skip in front of someone else in the security line. If you run into this situation, though, ask an agent for assistance to get where you need to go as quickly as possible. Yeah, connections certainly can create those kinds of issues. Absolutely. And I shouldn't have to say this, but rule number one is don't be rude to other passengers or the airport staff. The staff are just doing their jobs and don't deserve your derision and bad temper. And you have no idea why your fellow passengers are flying. Maybe they're traveling to a funeral of a loved one Or maybe they've already changed planes four times in the last 72 hours and are on their last nerve. 
just be kind. So true. You have no idea what is going on behind the scenes in people's lives. Don't be someone who adds to the drama or trauma, right? Right, exactly. Also, don't leave your stuff everywhere in the airport or train station like you are camping out. It's not your apartment. And don't take all the electrical outlets for charging. Leave some for other people to use. I see this last one all the time these days. Yeah, I really hate that. That's my pet peeve. I hate it when people ask me to watch their bags as well. Like who knows what's in their bag, right? Like it makes me nervous. Yeah, yeah, definitely with all the safety and security issues. Though if you're a solo traveler and you have to go to the bathroom, you may not want to lug all of your baggage into the stall with you. Just saying. True. Now, I would imagine though that once you're on the plane and it's more of a confined space, etiquette is going to become even more important. Absolutely. There's so many things though that you can do to help make the flying experience a good one for everyone around you and yourself. My biggest pet peeve Mm. are the reclining seats. Right. My boys are tall. And if the person in front of them reclines their seat, their knees are being crushed very painfully. They don't recline their own seats because they don't want to inflict the same pain on the passenger behind them. Really, it's my opinion that the seats, especially in economy, should not recline at all. I hope I'm not going to get canceled for saying that, Walker. A little opinionated there. Oh, right? <laughs> you feel, I feel very strongly. strongly about reclining seats. <laughs> <laughs> well, although legroom isn't an issue for me, I do get wiggly as I find there isn't enough lower back support in the seats, mm-hmm. you know, the lumbar control. And so I get really uncomfortable. I do recline in teeny weeny little bit every once in a while just to sort of switch my body position but never to the point where it would seriously compromise the space or comfort of anybody behind me I'm very respectful of that yeah why would you irritate somebody and then adjust where their tray is going to be and their screen etc absolutely the other thing too I might mention is don't bring that fish curry that you just bought (sighs) at the airport food court on the plane it stinks and Don't douse yourself in perfume or cologne. Strong smells can make people seriously physically ill. And let me just remind you that vomit really doesn't smell very good. Do you know, Walker, who gets the armrests on the middle seats? If I had to take a guess, I would say probably the middle seat does and that those on the aisle in the window only get one armrest. Am I correct? You got it. And it seems to be the only benefit, really, of sitting in the middle seat. So... Even if those people who are sitting in that middle seat aren't using it, don't use their armrest aisle and window people. The middle seat may want it later and it's theirs to use. Okay, so what about people who touch you all the time during the flight? Uh, Okay, (laughs) what do you mean by that, Walker? People are touching you all the time on the plane. You know what I mean. Their knees and elbows are always crossing that invisible line between the seats. Gosh, I know. That is so annoying. (laughs) Once or twice in a flight is fine, but over and over, come on, that's a bit much. I always tend to make myself as small as possible so I don't have to interact at all with the person beside me. Right. Well, it's a tight space, particularly in economy. Mm -hmm. We need to be mindful of other people's space. Absolutely. So think about how many times you need to get up from your seat. If you're in the window or middle seat, plan those visits to the washroom. And when you do walk down the aisle, be aware of where you are moving your body and where your bags are. Don't bang into people. Right. I was actually whacked in the face on my most recent flight by a woman's backpack and she had no idea. Oh, that's terrible. I know. So what about those annoying kids behind you who are kicking your seat or pushing their feet into your back? Mm -hmm. I think it's perfectly fine to say something in a nice way. Those parents are probably exhausted already, so maybe don't be a jerk about the way you Mm -hmm. point it out. Hopefully, if they're reasonable, they'll just get their kids to stop. This actually happened to me on an Alitalia flight. I was in the very last row of the airplane for this eight, nine hour journey by myself with a four-year-old on one side of me and a three-year-old on the other and my one-year-old on my lap. Well, that sounds like bliss. Oh yeah, it was a lot of fun. (laughs) Let me tell you, it was a good time. And my one-year-old was so squished that I guess his movements were felt by the person in front of me. Right. He wasn't kicking the seat, mind you. And this person happened to be a teen girl whose parents very, very rudely informed me that I needed to cease and desist kicking their seat. And there I was, a hot, sweaty mess, managing three kids under the age of six all by myself. Their attitude was not helpful. And frankly, Walker, I'm going to admit this to you, I wanted to give them a little bit of a kick. (laughs) Yikes. So what about babies? 
and I, I'm going to be honest here because I know some of my friends are listening. I used to be very vocal about this when oh, I was okay. single. Okay, and full disclosure. Full disclosure. When I was younger, I always thought it'd be a fantastic idea to have some soundproof, glassed-in section on the plane for screaming babies and their parents. You know, but now I realize as a parent that those babies didn't ask to come on the plane, that the parents are usually doing the best that they can. Absolutely. It actually doesn't bother me, but I know that that's not true for everyone. Unfortunately, babies cry. It's part of their job description. And yes, they did not ask to be on that plane. It's the one bit about flying I'm afraid we'll all have to deal with from time to time. I would say invest in a good set of sound canceling earphones or at minimum, bring your earplugs if it bugs you. These rules of etiquette might seem like common sense, but when people aren't practicing good manners, it can be really frustrating. It can be very upsetting as well. It actually really can be. We need to be thoughtful about how our behavior impacts those around us. We can achieve much of what we need to without having to interfere with someone else's enjoyment and well-being. Etiquette gives us those guidelines for behavior that can kind of smooth out those edges of human interaction. Well, that's a really good way of putting it, Harris. Today, we have the pleasure of speaking with Lucy Challenger, leading etiquette expert and the CEO and founder of the award-winning domestic and training agency, Polo and Tweed in Britain. Welcome, Lucy. Hello. How are you? Very well, thank you. Thanks so much for being with us today. Of course. So many people equate etiquette with tradition and formality, though some of the most common pleasantries seem to be fading from our society. How would you define etiquette and why do you think it's important today? Well, this is a big question. So (laughs) I think what we have to first look at is, is what is etiquette? So etiquette originated from the French courts between the 16 and 1700s. And the king at the time, Louis, um, used a sign saying etiquette, which was used to say, keep off the grass, because he didn't want people trampling all over his beautiful lawn. And so his gardeners put up these signs, etiquettes, to warn anyone from, you know, treading on the king's flowers. Um, And the court members then learned that etiquette had to be followed and was a sign of respect. Um, And and so this fed through into the court systems themselves into how, you know, one behaved in the setup. And, you know, you didn't want to cause offence to the king. You certainly didn't want your head getting chopped off. um, And you wanted to behave in the correct way without making faux pas. So that is how etiquette evolved and and began and from that point on it has transpired through society and we see it of course in modern day times and and linked very closely with manners Mm -hmm. so to answer your question why you think it's important well manners are important I I believe Um, you know we meet people when we travel we meet people in family situations in business situations and the more understanding you have of cultural etiquette and manners, mm-hmm. the more you can make friends, the more you can create lasting and positive relationships, because etiquette provides this framework for what is acceptable and polite. Mm-hmm. And do you feel, as I said, that some of these pleasantries and politeness in our society is fading somewhat? I feel like it doesn't have the same priority in some circumstances that it used to. I think it's I think it's evolving. So... Mm-hmm. You know, let's take sort of the traditional idea that a gentleman must open a door for a lady. Mm-hmm. Well, of course, in modern times, we have now many different concepts of what a woman or a man is. So mm-hmm. you have a question of gender in the first place, but also you have a question of why is it polite to hold the door open? And actually, I would hold the door open for anyone. So yeah. I would open the door if someone had a bags full of shopping, if they were carrying a baby, I would open a door for a gentleman. I, I certainly wouldn't see that it was beneath me or not my place to do so because I respect, you know, to to, to give way, as it were, to that person walking through the door and hold the door for them. Mm -hmm. So I think we see an evolution of manners. Um, Is it polite to offer someone a seat who's um, elderly or or pregnant? Absolutely. Um, Although you'd be surprised how few people offered me a seat when I I was pregnant in the London Mm -hmm. undergrad. So I I think that we have lost certain aspects of it but I also think it evolves and and also I think people don't realize when they're following it so 
if you were to attend a wedding, that wedding would follow quite a traditional typically path of etiquette with the wedding breakfast and you know the bride and groom or the bride and bride or groom and groom or how, whoever's getting married the, the walk down and how they're presented to people these are all forms of etiquette we just don't realize that that's what it is so it still exists I think people just aren't always clear on the definition of it of, or, or where they might do it themselves right right all good points so let's talk about your social media I have to say I find it so entertaining and instructive. (laughs) One of my favorites recently was you were giving an instructional video on how to climb onto a quad bike or an ATV, as we say in in North America, wearing a dress, a beautiful dress, I might add, and (laughs) heels. So is this a common etiquette question you you receive? (laughs) (laughs) So the Heels series started back when I'd first originally started doing videos on TikTok and I did a few series of how to walk in heels. I presented them as, you know, a lady or indeed anyone who's choosing to wear heels may find themselves in scenarios where they're, you know, having to walk on grass or walk down a slope or walk with a prom dress or a big dress on or a wedding dress. And how does one walk and retain their elegance and style whilst doing it? And so it started out with a sort of you know quite a serious but fun tone of videos and then people challenged me to a few uh, scenarios um one being you know how do you get in and out of a tractor or with heels so <laughs> so from that on then it's sort of this spiral of and I've done some rather you know tongue-in-cheek ones of how to get on and off a horse with heels on which one really shouldn't be doing right. um you know we do see occasionally women in the movies or, or people in the movies wearing heels on horses so You know, I think the thing with social media, at least for me, is I want to have fun with what I'm doing. And I hope that even though I am teaching skills and knowledge, I think if you're too dry with it, people will switch off. And particularly that, you know, the TikTok audiences, they they want something that's that's entertaining. Um, So I try to mix in the more serious videos with with some fun and you know tongue tongue in cheek videos like the like the quad bike ATV that, that you mentioned. But I think the most common etiquette questions I receive will typically be around dining. Okay. So, you know, things like what to do if you can you blow on your food if it's too hot? Um, what do you happen if you've taken a bite of something and you don't like it? You know, how do you remove it from your mouth? There is constantly a debate going on with the fork. Uh, right. uh, which <laughs> which is hysterical in itself. Um, You know, how does one hold a knife and fork? Which hand should it be in? How do you face it, place it on your table and your plate? You know, all of this, um, which sounds rather comical, but, you know, again, is based in history, etiquette practices of of the courts and patterns of behaviour that we found in society. And it's very important too, especially in certain circumstances, you want to be able to behave appropriately and not, certainly not cause offense to anyone yeah I really love your work because it is education in an entertaining fashion so I do believe that your listeners are probably and your followers are really absorbing the skills that you're that you're teaching you're a mom (laughs) yes I am and we're both moms as well how can we ensure that our children understand the importance of practicing proper etiquette? What are what are the good basics to start with, perhaps when they're young? Sure. Well, my son is seven, and and I was taught etiquette as a child by my parents, my by my grandparents, and I think it's a really great time to start. You know, like when you teach a child anything, reinforcing good habits of behavior. Mm-hmm. Um, but I think you have firstly have to take into account obviously how old your child is. You know, a, a two year old versus a seven year old versus a 14 year old are all going to absorb information differently. Um, and, and I think with my son, what I've learned over the years is that you start with one task, as it were, and then reinforcing that and layering it. Like with any form of education, there's no point overloading. Mm-hmm. With children, it's really important you make it fun. Um, you, you sort of make them engaged with why you're doing it. So, you know, educate them in a way that is exciting rather than just sort of droll, um, mm-hmm. but also stressing the importance of why we're doing it. So there's some key things that I have taught my son from, from the get go. It doesn't always happen straight away, but, you know, it's a work in progress. So firstly is, is how he behaves at dinner table. Um, my son, a typical seven year old boy, 
wriggles, wants to sort of sit on his chair with his feet, God forbid, put his feet on the table, you know, constantly moving about. And, and so I explained to him, look, Noah, to get good digestion, we should sit with our feet on the floor, we should face the table, and we should keep our elbows off the table so that we're not pressing our diaphragm and you can then eat and digest your food um and then you know he remembers for a while and they start to wriggle and then i reinforce the message a basic one would be don't don't talk with your mouth full no one wants to see a masticating you know <laughs> animal at the table um so you know keeping your mouth closed to eat is really important and of course a seven-year-old gets very excited and wants to tell me about all the things that happened to the school day and mommy 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 and um, Noah I really want to hear your story right now but could you just swallow first and then talk to me um so again I'm not chastising him I'm just encouraging that that sort of reinforcement of the message polite conversation at the dinner table again maybe it's something to do with him being a little boy but he loves to talk about poo for some reason (laughs) What is that? Why do they want to talk about poo all the time? I don't know there's this fascination I don't know if they ever grow out of it to be honest um, but I have to remind him and my husband to uh, not be talking about this at the dinner table because, you know, we're eating and um, to, to, to keep this conversation for another time. Um, so, again, you, you, you're, you're making the child realise relevance to what they're saying mm-hmm. um, and encourage that, that behaviour. And then finally, you know, before he gets down to thank the person who's cooked the meal for him, to ask to, to, to get down from the table if he's He's got friends or you know peers visiting and eating with him to wait until they've finished and never to complain about the food even if he doesn't like it mm-hmm. um, and that's a hard lesson I think for a child to learn is that you know they haven't learned that filter that we learn yes. through social etiquette and, and interaction and so my son will put something in his mouth and go oh this is disgusting and so I say okay Noah it's okay that it's not for your palate and that you're not keen on it but someone's made this for you and just say it's not for your liking and you'd prefer not to eat it and that's absolutely fine but we also have the rule that he tries everything at least twice (laughs) yes I think that's an important rule and I think that's also a lesson that is very well learned early in life and in fact I wish I had spent a little bit more time on that one with my own children (laughs) it's it's fascinating I mean I many years ago to digress slightly with a very quick story I was traveling once I left school before I went to university and I was living in Greece for a portion of time and a dear friend of mine came to visit and we sat in this beautiful Greek island um, having a meal and I ordered fresh fish and um, because I love seafood and and I said would you you know would you like to try some and she said well I don't like fish and I said oh okay when was the last time you had fish and she said I don't think I've ever had it and you know we were sort of young adults at this point and I said but how do you know you don't like it if you've never tried it Ooh. and she said well I never I was never given it as a child so I never then ordered it and I've never tried it and I said okay well here's the fork <laughs> off you go now's the time off, you know <laughs> Chew, chew, train into the mouth, but I did encourage her to try it. Um, and she ate it. And I remember her face changing and saying, Oh my gosh, this is incredible. And I was like, Mm hmm. Yeah. And you've well, missed a whole light, your whole lifetime up to now without eating seafood because you yeah. were just. Yeah, yeah. Because, she, because her world, understandably, was was limited in that area and that's not her fault but Mm. I think parents even if they're not keen on a certain taste or flavor always get your child to just try it once um, within reason you know maybe avoid the wasabi when they're two Um, (laughs) but you know just get their palates to explore these tastes and flavors because life is short exactly you want to have those horizons expanded as much as possible yeah. So Lucy, Great Britain with its long and storied history is a society that I would perceive as expecting proper etiquette. How can an unassuming North American preparing before they travel not to make a misstep while visiting in Great Britain and specifically? Well, I think the first thing to say is it's important to remember that most situations one would find themselves within in the UK will probably be a semi or informal setting unless you have been invited to a formal dinner be it a Michelin star restaurant or a formal banquet or perhaps a a dining private dining where you know there's a formal aspect to it that most places that are informal you're unlikely to cause offense unless you do something really really out there Um, but I think the first thing that I think 
often comes as a surprise, particularly to um, North Americans, is the way we use our knife and fork. So the traditional British etiquette is that the fork is in the left, the knife is in the right, and the fork tines, as in the little points in the fork, face downwards. So at no point do you flip the fork around and have it facing upwards, so sort of curved upwards as it were. The fork always should face down. Now, what you see a lot in, in the States is that the knife will be placed down, the fork will then transfer over to the right hand, and then people will scoop or spear or use their fork in a sort of 360 degree way with the right hand as opposed to the left hand. Now that's called the zigzag technique and it evolved through your own history of immigration and people coming to America and you know your your own history as, as well you know with the influence of different cultures mm -hmm. and it's absolutely fine to do and I see it happening in the UK however in a formal setting it can be deemed to be not as polite if the fork transfers into the right hand as opposed to the left hand. And if you start to scoop or shovel, for want of a better word, the food into the mouth, which of course sends people into a bit of a panic when they think, well, how do I eat, you know, those little green peas? How could I possibly get that into my mm -hmm. mouth if I'm having to balance it on on the top of the fork, which is often a debate as whether it's the top or the bottom. Um, I have to shovel it. But these are techniques that obviously I've learned as a child and through my life and it's practice basically. So the general rule of thumb is that you wouldn't use your hands in a formal dining setup and that the knife remains in the right and the fork in the left. Sometimes with desserts, you can have the fork in the right if it's a fork and a spoon, um, but typically the fork stays in the left. So, so that's one of the big things to think about. And I think also just as a general rule for anyone traveling to any country, is follow the lead of the person around you. So if you've been invited to a dinner, you know, follow the host, look at diners around you, how they're behaving, how they're eating, respect the rules of the house or the host, as that's a good way to avoid that faux pas and offend someone. Just, just really think about where you are in your environment. Little things in the UK, it's respectful to offer to take your shoes off before you enter someone's home. That varies from different country to country, but pretty much in the UK, you know, if you walk into someone's home, you say, would you like me to take my shoes off? Um, and never attend an event without small gift, particularly if it's a private home. Um, so, you know, a bottle of wine, flowers, chocolates, candles, etc. And then finally, the peace sign, uh, which one uses with their fingers, your version is actually an insult to the UK. <laughs> so we do the peace sign with the palm facing forwards um, and you guys do the peace sign with the reverse uh, with the, the back of the hand facing people but that actually means to um, tell someone to something else. <laughs> Uh, so, um, so please, if you're going to tell someone to peace out, just check you're doing it the right way around, because otherwise you might have a very upset person in front of you. <laughs> well, this is fabulous information. I was going to ask you about the topic of crossing the pond and etiquette, observing etiquette while traveling. You covered that a little bit. Just wondering, though, before people travel, would you recommend that they do a little bit of research for the, for the country they're visiting? Absolutely. And um, when you do your research, I would strongly recommend that you avoid hearsay websites. You know, you, mm. you, for example, the UK has a, a travel advice website that the government run. Um, I don't know if there's a similar website in the US, but I, I imagine there will be something that's endorsed by, by the government. Um, and that will have factual information. For example, it will say, you know, the population, it will say if it follows a specific religion, the type of currency, all of these things. I've traveled extensively in the Middle East. Um, and when you're in the Middle East as a, a white non-Arab, I am very aware of how I dress, dressing conservatively to not draw attention to me, when I've been in Saudi Arabia, I wear a veil so that, again, I don't put myself in a situation where I become uncomfortable or break the law. Because ultimately, when you step foot into someone else's country, you have to follow the law of the land. And it, it, it is highly inappropriate not to do so. So that goes well above and beyond respecting the etiquette and cultural differences. You know, you have to respect the law of where you are. You know, public displays of affection in the Middle East are a huge no-no. You know, you can end up in prison for doing that. 
match. Whereas, you know, in the US and the UK, you can you can kiss your husband or partner, you know, hello in public. You have to be very careful doing things like that in the Middle East. And you can forget because often you feel that you've you know, you've just got off a plane and you've forgotten that you've entered a completely new sort of ecosphere of of laws and, and cultures and etiquette. So yeah, do your research, use trusted websites. And then, like I said earlier, just, just follow suit. If you see everyone queuing to get on the bus, then you should queue. If you see everyone pushing, then <laughs> go for it. You know, like you've got to kind of, when in Rome, as it were, follow suit in order to, to keep yourself safe as well. Well, this is really important information. Not only, as you say, it it's becomes beyond an etiquette issue. It becomes a safety issue in many respects. Yeah. Um, so please tell us a little bit about Polo in Tweed. Now, I understand that you place highly qualified staff in domestic settings, whether, for instance, it's on a country estate, a yacht, or a city villa. How do you vet and train these professionals? I'm sure it's quite an involved process. And, you know, what are you looking for in a top drawer candidate for your clients? So I set up Polo and Tweed because I myself have had the need for domestic support. As a mum, I wanted to go back to work full time after having my baby. And I recognised that I needed someone who I could trust fully. And I saw a gap in the market, particularly in the UK, but all, all around the world, because we work with global clients and candidates, of finding trusted, vetted, high quality staff to place in their homes. So I set up Polar and Tweed back in 2015. And then we shifted into training as well, because I'm so passionate about training and education and, and I fundamentally believe that if you give someone the power over their own career and their skill set they can evolve in the way they wish to. So because we have clients all around the world we have a database now of over 40,000 candidates looking for work and these candidates are all around the world so we have candidates in the US, we have candidates in the Middle East, um, in Asia, in, in the UK, in Europe etc and candidates come to us because they see the great jobs that we're advertising and then we take them through our vetting process. And we have one of the most extensive vetting processes around. I do have competitors that do what we're doing, but I do believe that we are the most thorough in our vetting. Um, and, and by that, we meet with them, we're taking reference checks, we're following up with the referees to make sure that the referees are, are indeed you know, valid. We check their right to work. We're taking medical questionnaires. We're taking criminal background checks you know we're doing an extensive process before they ever get to meet our clients because I want my clients to know that they we have a duty of care to give them the very best and this is who we present now of course each client is going to have a specific requirement for what they want in the house so for example if you came to me for a housekeeper your your standards of housekeeping and how you want your house to be run may be different to mine and may be different to someone else so we can't judge what the client wants in terms of the specificity without that candidate then walking in the door or what the client informs us. So if the client says to us, I want a my house run like a boutique hotel, you know, I want five star service in my house, then we know that the type of candidate we're matching for them has to have previous experience working in high net worth families working in large estates, detail with the work so that when they walk in and they're confronted with marble and antiques and chandeliers and the elevators in the houses, which they do exist in private homes, you know, they know how to handle this. So we're matching the candidate to what the client wants, but also what the candidate has the capacity to do. And then we offer training. So we, we help them with housekeeping and butlering and silver service and etiquette and everything that will help them enhance their careers and lives. Um, but also if a client comes to us and says, you know, I've got a team of, say, five housekeepers, I'd like two of them trained in silver service, I'd like one of them trained in butlering, you know, we can then go in and assess the situation. And in later years, what I've been doing is I go into private homes myself. So I am called by a client who will say, you know, we've got a breakdown of staffing. I don't know what's going wrong. Help. Uh, because often people don't know what the problem is. So I then go in, I observe, I look at the situation, I see what the staff are doing, perhaps where they're falling short, do they need more training, do we need to recruit for them, and then I come up with an entire package for them. So that's something that I love doing because I have the expertise when it comes to domestic staffing and, and the hierarchy. I think what makes a top candidate is flexibility, uh, discretion and confidentiality, and 
the desire to please and serve. And I think that these are innate skills that people have. You know, some people just have great satisfaction when they do a good job for someone else. And some people have great satisfaction when they do a great job for themselves. And if you are neither, neither is good or bad. <laughs> I am the latter. I, I, that's why I'm a business owner, because I take joy in doing something and making it work for myself. I would be terrible as a domestic worker, but I recognize that some people are brilliant at that and have that joy of giving to other people. And that's what makes an amazing candidate, which then we place with an amazing client. We'd like to thank you so much for sharing your expertise with us today. We are certain that we, as well as our listeners, will all be a better behaved bunch. For our listeners, you may follow Lucy Challenger on TikTok at at Lucy Challenger Official and Instagram at Lucy Challenger. You may also find her on her website at www.poloandtweed.com and we'll be placing all that information in our notes. Thank you very much, Lucy. Thank you. Thank you so much. It was a pleasure to speak to you. As Lucy Challenger explained, etiquette has deep historical roots. I thought it'd be kind of interesting to delve into some of the lesser known and perhaps more strange rules of etiquette, which have been practiced over time. Now, Walker, I have to warn you, most of these rules of etiquette are for us ladies to mind. The gentlemen of the times had a lot more freedom than we did. Of course they did. Now, it's a good thing I suspect that I was born when I was. Otherwise, I fear I'd be quite the rule-breaking renegade. Yes, I think you would be, (laughs) and I'd be right beside you. Well, this is one rule I know that you might have broken once or twice. According to the British Guide, The Habits of Good Society, a handbook of etiquette for ladies and gentlemen, a proper lady should only drink one glass of champagne. Anything more than that would be considered improper. Well, there you go. I failed already. Yeah, you and me both. (laughs) How about this one? I break this rule too on the daily. Women should wear their hair up at all times unless they are in the privacy of their bedchamber. The idea behind this rule of etiquette was that it made sure that women looked polished and composed and not a wild, free-spirited Jezebel. Oh my God, Eris, you almost made me choke on my coffee. I know, crazy, (laughs) right? Well, yes, different times. Here's one that might challenge you, Harris. I read that in the 1890s, it was considered proper for women to give predominantly handmade gifts. Uh Uh-oh. Women would give gifts to men only after they received a gift themselves. And when they did give one in return, the present was to be inexpensive or handmade. Oh, man. Clearly, I am living in the time that it is most appropriate for me and my handcrafting abilities. You don't think Greg would like only handmade gifts from you? (laughs) I don't think so. (laughs) Well, the blog Etiquipedia, edited by etiquette enthusiast Maura J. Graber, is a great source of neat etiquette-related information. Here you can find some text written by Lady Sow in the Han Dynasty, which lays out some rules of etiquette for women and girls. Now listen up, Harris. I'm listening, all ears. Girls who have not yet left the home, meaning they're not married, must carefully pay reverence to their parents. They should rise early every day. If the morning is cold, then the daughter should build a fire to warm them. If it's warm, then the daughter should use the fan to cool them. And if the parents are hungry, the girls must hasten to supply their parents with food and drink. Wow, I think those roles might be reversed these days. It sounds much more like what we do every day for our kids. I hear you. Listening about ancient Chinese etiquette in the home makes me think that the rules of etiquette really do vary widely from place to place and culture to culture. Isn't that right? Yeah, that's definitely right, Walker. In fact, it's really important to understand the cultural etiquette of a country before you visit. As we said earlier, it not only is respectful to abide by the local social rules for good manners, but in some cases, not performing good etiquette could become a personal safety and security issue. Now, American writer Lauren Kahn has created a handy and concise global etiquette cheat sheet to ensure that you don't offend anyone in your host country when visiting. It is surprising how easily we can offend people in different countries simply by what gestures we make intentionally or unintentionally. I need to get my hands on that cheat sheet, Walker. Never fear. We will put it in the show notes. Okay, good. Here are a few to get you started, though. If you're going to give me the thumbs up, Harris, be careful where you do it. In Russia, Greece, Iran, Sardinia, and parts of West Africa, this gesture can be perceived as a flipping off someone. Hmm. Who knows what shenanigans a misplaced thumb can lead to, right? Yeah, absolutely. I had no idea about that. 
Oh, also, don't put one hand in your pocket. This is perceived as arrogant in some Middle Eastern countries and South Korea. Wow, I didn't know about that one either. Also, next time you're in a crowded bus in Russia, remember this one. Never turn your back to the person you're squeezing past. It's considered rude. Hmm. And remember that when you're in France, rethink the indiscriminate hugging. It's considered more intimate than shaking hands or la bise, which is the double cheek kiss. Ah, yes, la bise. It can be a little tricky to navigate too, can it? Which cheek do you start with? I think you offer the right cheek first, Harris. Now, beyond the hug and kiss, you also have to think of your feet. In Thai culture, it's considered rude to expose the soles of your feet Don't put your feet up on furniture or point your feet in the direction of a religious person or religious symbols such as statues of Buddha. Yeah, I think there's a similar rule of etiquette in Africa about feet too, isn't there? That's right. Another good rule to remember is to keep your hands to yourself. (laughs) In many countries, it's not acceptable to touch other people's feet or head for that matter. In some Southeast Asian countries, the head is considered sacred. Yeah, keeping your hands to yourself should be pretty much common sense. (laughs) You would think. You would think. (laughs) I generally avoid touching other people's feet, most definitely, (laughs) and just touching other people in general if I can help it. Personal space and all of that, you know. Well, that's a good philosophy. There are a lot of rules of etiquette that involve the feet, actually. There is a symbolic association with them being unclean. For example, it's widely expected in Southeast Asia that all shoes are left at the door so as not to track dirt into the house. Yeah, that makes total sense Mm -hmm. to me. We also take our shoes off at the door, though I know it's not really considered to be a common custom in North America. Right. Removing footwear is considered especially important when it comes to mosques and temples. Mosques usually have a shelf or a specific area where you can leave your shoes. Yeah, that's really important to know because there is a real chance of causing serious offense, particularly in a religious context. Yeah, this reminds me of the first time that I encountered a situation where I was not prepared for what would be an acceptable dress code. It was my first trip to Italy and friends of mine had decided they wanted to tour Vatican City. At the time, women were expected to wear long skirts, dresses or pants. And I was in Italy to take part in an archaeological excavation. So I only had shorts with me. Needless to say, I didn't go. I ended up touring the Roman Forum that day. Yeah, I've also run into the same issue. I learned to carry a wrap with Uh, me that I could twist about my waist into a long skirt to cover my bare legs if we ever chose to go in a church or, or, or something like that. That's a really good tip. Now, do you remember the old expression when you point at something or someone, three fingers are always pointing back at you, so you shouldn't do that? No, I've never even heard that saying. Seriously? Yeah. Oh, well, it must be a Southern Ontario thing. Our parents said this to us all the time when we used to point. Well, in Africa, pointing with your index finger is considered rude and offensive. Wow, I had no idea. That would be a super easy one for Westerners to mess up. So how are you supposed to indicate what you're trying to point out? Well, our listeners won't be able to see this, but imagine this. You are supposed to poke your chin out in the direction of something you want to show or indicate and widen your eyes at the same time. Oh, okay. Well, I think you need a little practice on that one, Walker. I know. I was trying it out on the weekend and my kids thought there was something seriously wrong with me. (laughs) Like I was choking or something. I think it had to do with, I might have been opening my eyes too wide. I don't know. Yeah, you need to work on it. (laughs) Etiquette often seems to be heavily involved in the customs of eating and drinking too, as Lucy Challenger alluded. I would imagine that these rules also vary a lot from place to place. They sure do. For example, in Korea, when an elder offers you a beverage, accept it with both hands, but make sure to turn your head away as you take your first sip as a sign of respect. Mm. And in the UK, I read, if you're passing the port, a fortified wine, it must always be passed to the left. I wonder what the story is behind that last one. I have no idea. Maybe we'll ask Lucy this next time. Good idea. (laughs) So what is considered rude in Western culture? that is considered perfectly acceptable in other cultures. I can think of one example. My youngest kid learned that slurping your noodles is very welcomed in Japan and has adopted that custom here. However, it's not really smiled upon when we're all out for dinner. 
Oh, so true. Here's another example. We're brought up in North America to eat everything on our plate so as not to waste food. In China, however, apparently you shouldn't eat everything on your plate because it sends a message to your host that you're still hungry and that they didn't provide you with enough food. Oh, wow. That's also something I didn't know. Mm -hmm. I have heard that there are cultural differences in how punctuality or the lack of it is viewed as well. Yeah. In North America, Germany, South Korea, and Japan, being punctual is socially preferred. In Malaysia, though, people don't have the same attitude towards being prompt. It's perfectly normal to be 5 to 60 minutes late with no reason necessary to be given when you finally do show up. In Greece and Mexico, too, there is some flexibility for lateness. You can be late by 30 minutes with little to no consequence. And at the extreme end of the spectrum, in Morocco, apparently, if you're late an hour or even a full day, it really isn't a big deal. That's a lot. That's a lot. (laughs) (laughs) Punctuality is pretty important to me, so I think I would really have to manage my expectations when traveling to some of these places so I wouldn't get unduly upset. I have to admit, that would totally drive me up the wall. This would take a lot of getting used to for me as well. My dad went to military college and we were always taught to be on time that it was a sign of respect yes. for the other person yeah. and their time, right? Yeah. You're valuing their time. I've always tried to be punctual, but you know, the odd time I get caught up with friends who, you know, they happen to be driving and therefore you're late because they're late and it drives me absolutely nuts. It really stresses me out. Yeah, it does. It's stre- I think we're both the same that way with punctuality. <laughs> And I would think, too, if you were doing business across borders, you would have to be very mindful of this because that could get in the way of happy business relations. So true. People do talk often about being fashionably late to social events here in North America. But in Venezuela, it's considered rude to show up on time for dinner. I read that people view this as acting super greedy, like... You're you're waiting for that free meal. Yeah, so you're, you're showing up at lunch. somebody's dinner party and you're there on time. That's um, that you just can't wait. Oh my god, that's <laughs> hilarious! And I have to say, I have felt like that before in the past. So <laughs> hopefully, I apologize to any host I may have offended. <laughs> There is a lot of opportunity for misunderstanding, really, isn't there? There certainly is. In Japan, it's considered rude to blow your nose in public. Mm. You're expected to excuse yourself and go somewhere private to blow your nose. Sniffle all you want, though, but blowing your nose is different. Whereas in North America, people are honking their schnozzes all over the place, right? Ah, I know, it's so (laughs) disgusting. But there are other more delicate issues, too, like toileting practices. Right. Unlike in North America, in many countries like Turkey, Macedonia, and Egypt, toilet paper is disposed of in a special bin located near the toilet, but not in the toilet itself. Right. I remember the first time I encountered this in Greece. I have to say, I was really taken aback to see this bin there. It was very hot. Mm -hmm. (laughs) You know, it just Mm -hmm. seemed like an unlikely thing to do. Yeah, not not overly sanitary. (laughs) But often this practice is employed because the plumbing may not be designed to handle that kind of solid waste and it could lead to clogging and flooding. And also, I think it's more common in areas that have limited access to water. Interesting, very interesting. It is. Bathrooms can be quite different from place to place. And so, as you say, a little bit confusing. Back to Japan, those toilets are super high tech. Like, honestly, it looks like you're about to take off on a spaceship. So many of them even play music or sounds to disguise any, you know, more unpleasant sounds you might hear. I like the sounds of that. Speaking of sounds, did you know that it's common in some African communities to call someone with a clicking or hissing sound? Hmm. This could be misinterpreted, I'm sure, if you weren't familiar with the gesture. Right. Author Mark Weens also points out that people should not be uncomfortable with spans of silence during African conversation. Hmm. African culture is very comfortable with silence, whereas North Americans try to fill up every gap in conversation. Mr. Ween states that if, you know, something needs to be said, it is. And if nothing needs to be said, silence is perfectly fine. I guess it's golden, right? Mm -hmm. Our chatty culture could learn a few things from this. Yeah, it's really interesting. All these differences in manners and practices, gestures and rules of etiquette. This is what makes travel the adventure that it is. 
Yeah, the best we can really do, I imagine, is to do our research in advance and be respectful when we visit. The key to remember is we are guests in the countries we visit. Mm -hmm. We won't be accustomed to every behavior we encounter. It is easy to familiarize ourselves these days through online research, travel guides, and consulting with friends and family who maybe have traveled to the same or similar destinations. As the Wanderlust Travel website states, knowledge is power when it comes to staying on the right side of the law during your trip. Yeah, that is excellent advice. It's always a good idea to mind your P's and Q's. Be mindful of what you say too, particularly if in reference to religious or political figures, right. monuments or sites. People can be very, very sensitive about these topics. And understandably so. I would advise that you gather as much information pertaining to what is considered acceptable in terms of dress, vaping, public drinking, public displays of affection, chewing gum, Yes, chewing gum and medications. Yeah. Before our trip to Mexico last month, my sister reminded us that you can't take certain allergy medicines into the country that contain ephedrine. And that's a pretty common ingredient in many over-the-counter medications in the States and Canada. So that could be a very easy and perhaps not so nice mistake to make. Yeah, right. I think people would be surprised to hear that. And of course, follow the basic rules of etiquette that you might find anywhere. Offer your seat to the elderly. Say excuse me if you need assistance. Say please and thank you and tip well. Yeah, and put that phone away. Right. I think the key is to be educated and then also be respectful. I find it embarrassing if fellow travelers are misbehaving or being disrespectful when I'm abroad. Take Amsterdam, for instance. I was there with the fam jam once and I was so embarrassed for young people who were there taking it all just a little too far in public. Yes, it's a stag and doe party destination known for its liberal, easygoing attitudes in red light district. But it's not surprising now that the city is trying to attract tourists who want to visit for cultural and historical reasons rather than be party central. I think the city has had enough of the excessive litter, noisiness and all the rest of that silliness that is a byproduct of the party crowd. Yeah, some people seem to lose all inhibition and decorum when they're traveling. Just because you're on holiday does not mean you can act like an animal, really, mm -hmm. or any differently than you would at home. Yeah, and take a cue from the locals. They'll give you the best idea of what the rules of etiquette and good manners are. Well, Harris, while in Rome, do as the Romans do. Well said, Walker. Many moan about the lost art of polite behavior, missing manners, and the social graces of bygone eras. Yet etiquette is alive and thriving in society today, though the rules of the game may change across borders and overseas. In the words of the infamous Emily Post, manners are a sensitive awareness of the feelings of others. Etiquette is about respect of others and their customs and truly of one's own self. So mind your P's and Q's and make those manners matter. Thank you for joining us at At Home and Abroad with your hosts, Harrison Walker. Follow us each week as we continue the conversation.